Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Elliott, and I'm here to talk about privacy in smart cities, and in particular, the role that user experience design, or UX, can play in uh, making smart cities more ethical. I'm the design director of Simply Secure. We're a US-based nonprofit that focuses on professional education. The people that we're educating are designers and developers and researchers and some users to uh, build skills in privacy, security, and ethics. And uh, the number one takeaway uh, from my talk, if you only have one slide or one moment, it's that you don't need to be a technologist or a lawyer to participate in smart cities and privacy. There's an urgent need for user experience designers in shaping how the city can work. So I'm from San Francisco and spent 20 years uh, working in, in tech um, in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley and uh, spent many years um, really uh, working towards and hoping for a smart cities revolution. The, the things that drew me to smart cities were a sense of ecological awareness, um, a concern about global warming in a coastal city with an uncertain climate and very severe drought. And I was also very eager to rethink the uh, American reliance on um, the car, on the automobile, as the kind of king of transportation. And I uh, was personally inspired um, you know, by the rise of new kinds of, of uh, sharing economy type things. So I wanted to start with a little bit about what some of the, the hopes and wishes were, because much of this talk is fairly critical or negative of the, the limitations of, of smart cities um, from a privacy point of view. So smart cities offer all of these uh, promises around quality of life improvements, but it's at the cost of data collection. And the mechanisms for data collection in smart cities aren't very well understood. So I'm gonna kind of talk you through three points. And the first is understanding the risks um, to users. So first of all, um, in security language, a threat model is a way to explain who you're worried about is going to take your data. In the smart city, who is it that you're concerned is, is going to harm you if they get access? And which one of these um, hackers or governments or companies or stalkers probably depends on your individual situation and where you are in the world. So, I mean, there, there are examples. I mean, the, the Internet of Things generally is hopelessly insecure. Um, you know, video cameras are getting pulled into botnets. There's a pretty well understood set of problems there. Um, but one example from Dallas, Texas, in the United States is hackers making warning sirens sound in the middle of the night um, just to uh, presumably frighten or upset people, or that was a side effect of their unknown intent. Uh, so smart city infrastructure isn't always secure. So um, some people are concerned about governments having access to their data. And um, you know, China is, is one example of a country that has been um, pretty clear that they're using technology um, to solidify state control and keep order. And one way in which this happens is facial recognition um, for people crossing traffic signals um, illegally, and then they can then get fines. So um, China's also taken this one step further and looking at a social credit score and restricting travel for people uh, with low social credit scores. And um, smart cities, of course, make it much easier to do that at scale. And um, I, I think that it's fair to critique if this is the kind of future that we want. But I'd also like to point out that a lot of the criticisms of, of China seem to be um, motivated by um, some nationalism and, and xenophobia and, and racism and, and aren't always very um, historically grounded in some of the other ways that infrastructure has been controlled. So, um, for example, I'm from um, the American South, 
And uh, restricting access to infrastructure is, is not something new for 2018. Um, for example, um, in the 1960s, uh, there were um, attempts, armed attempts with soldiers with guns um, to keep order. Um, by making sure that um, black people and white people remained segregated um, as they traveled um, on buses and as they sat in waiting rooms or, or drank from fountains. So I think a, a little bit of this you know, kind of context that you know, your threat model may depend. You know, in general, I've found that people in Germany have strong positive feelings about the government as a source of protection and um, skepticism or hostility towards the Silicon Valley companies. And um, in other contexts, that could be flipped. Um, in general, people in Silicon Valley are skeptical and mistrustful of the government and have strong positive feelings about the companies. So companies and governments come together in public-private partnerships in smart cities. And there's a whole venture capital kind of funded um, set of reasons why this happens in terms of investing in the, the equipment that's necessary to do something like this. And, and um, one provocative example is um, ShotSpotter. So ShotSpotter is an array of microphones um, over San Francisco and um, other cities as well. And what ShotSpotter does is it listens for gunshots all the time. So that's also a form of maintaining public order. And um, I think that most people in the city don't know that this is installed. And um, it's pretty interesting to note that um, there's an array of microphones controlled by a private company, a for-profit company, listening and recording snippets all the time, and then sending the relevant pieces to the police um, in order to prevent um, deaths from, from gun crimes. Presumably, you can arrest the, the people that fired the shots and take the person that got shot to the hospital. And so, in that kind of situation, it's very difficult to understand that your data is being collected just by making sound on a public street. It's very difficult to understand who has access to that data, the complex network of these public-private partnerships. So and just to round out the threat model, I want to um, also mention stalkers. Um, Gender-based violence is a global epidemic, and smart cities make it possible um, to control um, victims and their movements um, more effectively. So, um, you know, one example in, in the Facebook engineering team, someone was fired for using inappropriate access to data to stalk women. And um, that's something that I think that we might expect to see more of as these smart cities infrastructure gets more widespread. So that's a little bit about what some of the risks to users are. And what about the experience of smart cities? So um, I chose bike sharing in part because motivated by environmental concerns and um, an interest in rethinking the supremacy of, of the private car, uh, certainly in, in American cities. I think it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty provocative and, and, and generally positive. But what's really going on with these bikes as, as data collection instruments? So. Um, First of all, bicycles may sound wonderful and, and inclusive, but um, most of them require a smartphone and a credit card in order to work. So as more private companies invest more in that style of infrastructure, people without smartphones and people without credit cards are going to be unable to participate as, as fully in, in public life and, and move about the city. And, uh, the, in the picture you see, um, it's taken here um, in, in Berlin, uh, it's a docking station for the next bikes. This particular station is empty. And it's interesting because this is one of the few uh, bikes among the bike competitors that has um, a base, that there's a set of, of kind of you know, permanent e equipment that, that's always there that you can kind of look at and read at. The rest of them, rely on you to approach the bike and, and look at the kind of printing on the actual thing, and then you do it all with your smartphone um, without this other, um, you know, any other kind of display. Um, so this series of screenshots is from Mobike, and um, in general, 
the on-screen interactions, the user experience of these is, is very elegant and, and, and very, very easy to get going. It can take less than a minute from approaching a bike to the first time to downloading the app and get going. One of the ways that this is able to work so easily is the, the phone-based verification. So in this third slide over, it's um, handled where you have the phone in your hand, you enter your phone number, ask to be sent uh, an SMS code, enter the code, and you're set. You've authenticated yourself. So you don't need a user ID, you don't need a password, you don't have to have this other kind of piece of your identity, it's just your phone. And that is a, a positive in the sense that it's one less thing to keep track of. But I think it's unclear the implications of using something as personally identifiable as your phone number um, to stand in for you. So this means that my phone number is associated with me, of course, my billing address, and when I'm using the bike, anywhere I go throughout the city. It makes it possible to form these rich kind of hybrid physical digital models um, of my behavior, which of course is very attractive uh, to advertisers. So um, for Mobike, the Android app permissions are pretty surprising. Um, I happen to live near a hotel that frequently has uh, these bikes in, in front of them. And I've, I've chatted with numerous people visiting the city um, about the bikes. Many of them have never used a bike share before, but they're pretty clear that the, it's going to track them. And that feels like a fair trade-off for the plus of moving around the city. The kind of quote that captures that is, I'm a tourist, not a thief. It's fine to, you know, to follow me around. But if you look in the Android app permissions, which anyone can do if you go to the Google Play Store, um, hidden behind one of the, the links is this, this more complete list. And um, yes, of course, location is sharing, but you also give this mobile app the ability to directly call phone numbers, read your phone status, uh, to delete or modify the contents of your USB storage can read the home settings and shortcuts, access Bluetooth, change your audio settings, control vibration, the flashlight access. I mean, there's really a whole bunch of stuff, and it's not clear what all of that is for or what the implications of giving this over are. Um, but now I want to kind of target more specifically the, um, the terms of service. So in very fine point on the red, the Mobike terms of service, easily overlooked, you uh, can get into the details of the terms and conditions. So people in, in industry often call terms and conditions T's and C's for terms and conditions. But um, in English, it's kind of a nice uh, joke because it sounds like T's and then C's all the data. And that, that's really generally what these do. So behind this one red dot, there are um, 33 screens of very dense language explaining um, all of the things that, that Mobike wants to do with your data. And um, just to pull out two of them, Mobike may amend these terms from time to time. Your continued access to or use of the services constitutes consent to be bound by the amended terms. So if it changes and you don't know and you rent a bike, you've automatically consented to whatever the new terms are. And the latest terms can be found online. So by using the bike, you're agreeing to an unknown set of things that you probably haven't checked. And uh, some of the things in the terms of service gave me pause. One example is um, in the far right column, when using the services provided by Mobike, you may not. And there's a long list of things that you may not do. Um, that has to do with um, trying to reverse engineer their product or take their copyright. But somewhat surprising to me is submit, upload, or publish any defamatory, libellous, hateful, violent, obscene, pornographic, unlawful, or otherwise offensive content. So if I rent one of these bikes, and I stop and take a selfie and post it to Instagram, is some company or government going to say that I'm showing too much skin and that that should be censored? And I've now broken the terms of, of, of service of, of this by posting 
um, you know, pornographic content. These are really complicated questions, and it's really not realistic to expect challenges that are requiring like teams of legal experts and really kind of careful public discourse to be decided by someone just with a, a fat thumb who's only trying to get from one point to another on a bicycle. So um, there are many competing brands of these bikes around Berlin, and many other cities have, have multiple bikes as well. Bike is a, a German company, and um, that they provide certain kinds of German data protections. And that's an interesting kind of competitive advantage for how we could think about you know, local companies here in Berlin, here in Germany, can provide additional benefits for the people who use their products and services, where the additional benefits are privacy and transparency about how their data is used. But if you look on the, the kind of surface of the bikes, there's really no way to distinguish them. You can see that they're different colors. You may, if you're super knowledgeable about bikes, have a sense of which would give you better performance as a kind of, as a bicycle. But the whole piece of uh, the data use is completely hidden and, and difficult to discover. So I think it's worth in today thinking about what kinds of regional advantages can come from Germany and Europe and its history of stronger data protections, which are now, of course, turning into law. So I am um, new to Berlin, and this is a, a story that I'm still not tired of sharing, and I'm, I, it made such a big imp impression on me. Um, I'm a beginning German speaker with a very low language level, but I was reading this magazine in a hair salon because it's something that I can understand. And, um, you know, in the midst of all of this kind of, you know, royal family kind of uh, tabloid type stuff, there's an article about data protection for your smartphone. And this was just so shocking to me as someone kind of coming out of San Francisco, where even people who consider themselves like tech early adopters and are very motivated to try every new product and service just don't have the awareness or the interest you know, in, in this kind of topic. So I'm excited um, to be here in Germany and to think about ways of kind of cultivating you know, this, this advantage and, and putting new sets of kind of privacy aware, more transparent technologies out into the world. So back to bike. So um, these screens, even at this scale, I would hope that you could see are, are laid out. There's a bit more white space. There are easily scannable headings. It makes it possible to see at a glance, even at this far, more of the details about what's going on. But one of the things that put me personally at ease is that I could see up in the front that all, everything that happens here is happening um, in accordance with the German Data Protection Act and the German Telemedia Act. And although I'm not a lawyer, I can get a sense of a kind of brand halo, of a sense of like good things about this. And it's a really kind of interesting provocation to think about um, establishing um, trust, like what kinds of symbols and icons and, and decals might be available. The IoT Trustmark team has, has thought of, you know, a bit about some of these. But if I compare it to things like you know, organic food and what you can expect to get in a bio shop, there's general cultural awareness that there's some kind of cost performance trade-off, but that there's benefits. And I'm interested to see how this kind of um, set of data protections can, can be communicated. How can we communicate what those benefits are? So um, European law is changing um, on May 25th. This set of um, the general data protection regulations, or the, the GDPR, is coming into effect. And um, that law is very complex. It's basically book thick. And there's a whole kind of ecosystem of people and consultants springing up to advise companies on this. 
I think that the world is really watching how um, the European Court of Law is going to deal with some of the Silicon Valley companies and um, some of the um, choices that they're making around if or how to comply with this law. But of all of the elements of this law, one that I think is particularly relevant for looking at user experience design in the case of smart cities is consent. So the law is very clear that people must consent to what data is collected and that this data needs to be using language that is easy to understand, clearly distinguishable from other pieces of information, such as the terms and conditions, and that consent needs to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. So that sounds good to me, as someone that works in a nonprofit that focuses on privacy, security, and ethics. But as a professional, as someone who actually puts the pixels on screen so that people can go through these, these flows of, um, of software to rent a bicycle, I do not know how to do this. And this is a huge challenge because all of the care and attention to detail, all of the, the this is a, a language challenge, agreeing on words, agreeing on the order. There's very little um, attention or not enough attention being given to how to deliver that information in context so that people can be truly informed. So what I mean by that is if you're trying to rent a bike for the first time, you probably want to go somewhere. Like the main reason that people rent bicycles is because they want to ride bicycles. You're outside, almost certainly, and you've got your phone in your hand while you're also balancing you know, your credit card and your bag and all these other things. Everything that we know about how to make the UX good is about big targets for that fat thumb to hit. So you can see the thumb that's just so ready to hit continue and to agree. And it's really, really difficult to understand that when you're collect hitting continue with your fat thumb here, you are saying yes, this is the, the Mobike terms of conditions, super easy, super elegant, less than a minute to get up and going. When you hit continue, you're now saying that you're not going to post any unlawful content and that you're fine being bound by you know, changes to these terms and conditions in the future. I would question that that's not actually meeting the spirit of helping people be informed about what they're doing. So we talked a little bit about understanding the risks and a little bit about um, experiencing smart cities. What are some opportunities for design leadership here? So first of all, I would like to gently push back on one of the kind of um, uh, sets of, of projects or provocations I've been seeing a lot of. And this has to do with the idea that since you've got a smartphone in your pocket, wouldn't it be great to use this display to help you understand how you're interacting with the elements of the smart city? So, I mean, for example, you know, in Berlin, you frequently see physical signs that say, you know, video recording is happening here. This area is video recorded. What if you just pushed that onto your phone? And then you could find out, oh, your image is being recorded. Oh, your location is being tracked. Oh, the you know, IMEI number of your phone is being shared with other people. Well, the reason that that won't work is so many notifications are gonna come to you. We don't have a way to deal with that on the UX side. It's gonna be something like this. So this is a video taken of someone's Instagram notifications who's managing a football fan account. It's not in the smart cities domain, but I think it, it's pretty effective for showing the point that we are going to be overwhelmed with information. And it's not enough to write crisply worded uh, consent statements and push them onto people's phones. There's an avalanche of stuff coming to us and we don't have a good way to figure that out. This is a problem that goes beyond the, the confines of any individual app and into the whole OS layer. So I think you get the point. If you're interacting with a, in a smart city and your image is being recorded, um, how you walk and your gate can be recorded, information about your Bluetooth connections, your Wi-Fi, 
all of these kinds of things could be made available to the partners that you're participating in this with. And we don't necessarily know what all of those other business relationships are in these public-private partnerships. So, oops. So, um, next bike, to their credit, it's possible to use them without um, a smartphone. And one of the interesting things they've done is they have this very kind of lo-fi um, display on the actual bike. So that's something, that's kind of an interesting provocation. It's not a smartphone, it's another kind of surface. But I'm not sure that the UX designers of the world are, are thinking about this heterogeneity of devices, about public displays, about things embedded in bicycles or train seats or other pieces of city infrastructure. There's some unique design challenges there. <laughs> And finally, um, I think that you know, Facebook has come under a lot of really intense, well-deserved scrutiny um, for some of their uh, really, really poor choices around consent. But we just really got to get past cramming all this lawyer language into this very narrow uh, screen and expecting people to make good decisions about it. Um, and it's not only the fault of an individual app, at the operating system level, at you know, if you're looking on Android, if you're working um, on iOS, like you see here, we need to rethink the way permissions communicate meaningfully with people. So um, the summary point is that designing for consent and data collection deserves more attention. And UX designers have done such a good job of making it easy and fun to rent a bicycle. There's playful graphics. There's clear information. Really like to see some of this attention poured into the more complex things of terms and, uh, and conditions. And um, rethinking that is important. Much of what we know about what makes UX design effective comes out of a Silicon Valley mindset where more money and more growth is always better. So the entire kind of lean startup community has done a really good job of promoting things like build, measure, learn as a methodology, where if you're doing an A-B test and you have design A and design B, you can say design B is better if you get more money. Do more people buy more things? There's very clear agreement about what the right metrics is. And in contrast, if we're thinking about terms and conditions and consent, we truly don't know. If you have a design A and 100 people come to it and 95 go through and use the product and five refuse, is that better or worse than if design B and 50 people go through and 50 people refuse? There's some really fundamental questions about what the metrics for success are and how we know how well we're doing in terms of helping people understand what's happening. So um, I talked a little bit about risks to users, how you can experience smart cities through a bicycle uh, rental app, and some opportunities for design leadership. So the challenge here is for people to think about the user experience, the UX, to deliver better in-context consent. And UX designers, you are needed. There's important work to be done. Um, it's not only lawyers and technologists. Let's rethink how we can do consent and data collection in smart cities. With that, I'll put in a modest plug for our Simply Secure has a knowledge base of articles on all of these topics geared towards developers and designers and user researchers who want to do more work. And uh, with that, I will say uh, thank you.